Ari and I said, so what? I said, she's got two eyes, hasn't she? They were going together and she wanted her friend. Mm. They when they wanted you said you life. taught Maori craft to children, what did you teach? You, you said you used two Maori words I took. Oh, tuku tuku. Yes, I, how do I spell that? T-U-K-U, is it? And what's that? What's it? Tuka tuka is the panels where you thread the read through. And when you're really skilled, you work from the back because you've got to know the pattern backwards. <laughs> when it's from the front, you work that way. And you know where you're going, you see the pattern there. But the back, you've got to have the knowledge to put the read through at the right place for the person receiving it. And who taught you that? Well, when I was, uh, that's why I'm sorry I can't find those books because you could have taken those and left them with Bob and they could return them mm. with, with the bits and pieces from me and mm. contributed towards What were the names of the books? And Core Fi Fi K O W H A I W H A I. And what's that? Tarniko, T A N. Oh, please. <laughs> I-K-O. Mm -hmm. And what's that? What does that mean? It's that lovely weaving that they do, for, you know, for the belts and the headbands and so on. And action songs. Oh, how fabulous. When I went from the east coast down to Hawke's Bay, the different tribal area, and this, what was the Methodist church over here, is now at the Anglican Maori pastorate. Oh, okay. Uh, but they use, other churches do use it sometimes, and it's got mangungu on the front, which is the word for the broken reed, you know, from the book of Matthew in the Bible. Uh, we talk about the broken weed as the weak one that, mm -hmm. that but mm -hmm. if you bind together you get strength and you can't break it oh, that's what right. it means in Matthew you see oh, and the first me the first Methodist mi uh, missionaries that came to New Zealand they used that as their motto almost and their first mission house was Mangu, the same as this one oh, now that's lovely. the tribe that comes up the east coast it's Ngati Paro Mm -hmm. When it gets past Mahia, you're in uh, Ngati Kahununu tribal area. And those people where I, I went to in that place, oh, strange, strangely enough, my word coincidences again, because I got another picture of that how, our house from my friend Emily from Gisborne. And she. What, and, what does Nai Nai mean? Nai Nai means a mosquito. This was all bogs, all these little oh. valleys that go up are river valleys that come down, feed the Hutt River. Mm. And the Hutt River, you only see one third of the river on the surface, two thirds, and all these valleys. Underneath that school, and it affects my section here, one of the streams comes down and it's all drained underground. It comes out just past the school and you can see it and walk across the road uh, there. Now how it affects, <laughs> how that's affected me is that when they built this area, this was the last house, state house, there were no houses there. Mm -hmm. And they put the uh, store, big storm water drain, comes over from that corner, and it went, originally, it went on the other side of this tall fence between my place and the neighbours. Wow. And they, people, the neighbours, illegally built their garage on the boundary. It had supposed to have been 15 feet, but they illegally built it on the boundary. So that recently that old drain had to be repaired. Mm. And it was going to be too costly for the council and no doubt caused trouble with the neighbours. So instead of taking it on their side of the fence, they brought it over, you can see the marks on the outs and the street almost. And they brought it up my house on my side. Oh. And that's why I've got that big pool. They brought oh. the big drain, the stormwater drain through there and it goes down into the section behind me with the big outlets. And the, um, every time we get a flood, there's more water than that drain, I get the flood at my place here. And do you get the mosquitoes? No, <laughs> well I have them. Yes. <laughs> I was so it means mosquitoes. <gasps> no, just us. Just us. Just us. 
Just oh, because in our kids. Did you so, know? So yeah, start again. Rose going to help. Oh, oh, did I ever tell you how my parents met? Yes. Well, my aunt was too nervous to cycle home at night, and mother went when she was on duty at night. Mother went to meet her on their bikes, and this particular evening, they met mum. I saw these three uh, soldiers coming to it with the lemon squeezer hats, and mum, being the cheeky person that she was at 18 or something, she took the hat off the first one nearest her, and she put. Dad had shrapnel in his elbow and he was in plaster like this mm -hmm. and she played hoopla on his hand. <laughs> Just as her sister, who was always the spiteful one, they tell me even today, Auntie, don't mention Auntie Hart, she always caused rows in the family. She was that sort of type. Well, Auntie Hart couldn't wait to get home and tell on Mum. No Mum had to go through the dark for her. You know, what Rose did and couldn't, you know, tell Granny fast enough. <gasps> Typical big sister. <laughs> well, time elapsed, Max, Mum got another boyfriend, and I've got his patch. He was an ambulance driver, and he got over to France. Omar Khayyam was a favourite mm -hmm. book of verses, famous those days. Oh. She gave Tommy a copy of Grace Wade with the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam on gold on it. Mm -hmm. He gave her a little parcel about the same size and when she owned it up, she got the same book, didn't she? <laughs> oh, so they wrote, well. uh, they wrote letters to one another, then she got word uh, he only had one sister alive. And uh, uh, you know in the army when somebody dies they send somebody with their belongings mm -hmm. back if they can. And there was a knock one day at Granny's front door. And, um, oh, hang on, before I've jumped one, I've missed one bit. Uh, uh, Dad, no sooner got back in the trenches again, and he got the same arm injured. And Auntie Hart couldn't, like, first with the news, couldn't wait again. She said, Rose, she said, guess who we've got back at the hospital? She said, you know that chap you played hoop plow with? She <laughs> said, he's back again with shrapnel in the same elbow. Because oh, there was no talk of romance or anything like that, because mother had this other bloke, yeah. and he was an ambulance driver, and he got killed. And I've got Tommy's patch mm -hmm. in my box of my suitcase of bits and pieces. If she treasured it, <laughs> I treasure it, you know, till he goes. It won't mean anything to my children, of course. But you never know. Might to Diana, who's more yes. interested yes. than Brian at the moment. At any rate, um, there's a knock on my grand. Some time elapsed, a knock on my grandmother's door. And um, Granny answered the door, and a very Scottish voice said, Does a Miss Rose Osman live here? And Mum tells the story that Granny said, Yes, and who wants to know? And he said, Well, he said, We've got a very sad duty to perform. And he must have dropped his voice because she didn't hear what the duty was. Mm. She got was curious, but she didn't know what it could be. And then she heard her mother say in a more pleasant voice, Well, I think you better come in, boys. And, and it was these men, Dad had been given, mm. now, where's, what worked that out? Dad didn't ever know Tommy, Tommy never knew Dad. No. Never met, they weren't in the same no. group together or anything. But Dad had been given the job to, to, to deliver mm. letters that Mum had written to Tommy, plus mm. Omar Khayyam. So my mother had then two copies, identical, of Omar Khayyam. <laughs> <clears throat> and... Granny big-heartedly invited these. Any time, you, you boys must be home sick or you know, any time, and you've been so kind to Rose. Said, you know, pop in and have a cup of tea. Well, Mum said all oh, the people did that round there at Neck of the Woods. Yes. And Dad started going more often than not. And they became engaged. And guess what my father gave my mother? Oh, a third oh. copy of Omar Khayyam. Oh. So when Mum died, I had three copies of these little grey books. Mm. Now I've got a copy here, but not hers. Yes. I gave one to uh, Jane. I gave one to Alistair. I can't. I don't even know where, what happened yeah, to the other one. To but the copy I've got here. Have we still got that somewhere? I've got a copy that Mum bought me years ago. Yeah. But there's another a red one. copy. There's a little red copy. I just, I just know that, you know, 
that I had these three. And then when mm. I went to England in 1955, I stayed in a lovely home. It was a mill house with a friend for some time in um, Suffolk. And they had a church bazaar on. Mm. And this little place that I stayed in, Breadfield, is where Fitzgerald, who translated Omar Khayyam from the Persian into English, lived. And I've been in this classroom and see the scratchings on his desk and on the window and what have you. And I've been to his burial plot. I went there just after I'd had a big anniversary and the Persian ambassador had given 20 roses to the church yard yeah. for mm -hmm. a memento. And I've got that. And I don't know about how valuable it is, but they were cleaning out the church and they found a little tucked away cupboard, wonder what was in it, and there were two copies of this book, which I can put my hand on easily. 